Great, it's uh, an enormous pleasure to be here uh, and also to meet so many people who did their MA at Lancaster. Hello to you all. Uh, I'm talking today about Corpus Linguistics, Learner Corpus and SLA. Uh, this talk, as with many of my talks on Corpus Linguistics, will actually be gently critical of Corpus Linguistics. We can't improve the field without being self-critical. So today, I'll be talking about Corpus Linguistics. Corpus Linguistics, simply put, is the study of language using principally the method of looking at large volumes of attested language in use, whether that be written or spoken. And in the case of learner corporate, that means, of course, looking at the productions of learners, whether that be their writing or their speech in the L2. Of course, Corpus Linguistics is enabled by technology. Although if we look at the pre-computer era, we can find analogues of corpus linguistics, people who did sit down with large bodies of data and try to base their study of language on it, it was a very difficult technique to use before the computer was invented. Although some scholars did, including Arabic scholars in the seventh century writing grammars on Arabic using large volumes of data, which is quite amazing. Uh, but nonetheless, it's really something that came of age with the computer, and hence, to some extent, as Simpson, Black, and Swales have said, it is a technology itself. The machines allow us to quickly search and carry out statistical analyses on this language data. Nowadays, we can look at billions of words, let alone millions of words, and what we're finding, of course, is quite amazing. But today, I'm going to be critical, so I'll start off with a brief illustrative analysis of two near synonyms, good and great, in the Trinity Lancaster corpus, which is a learner corpus you'll find out more about later in this talk. The type of thing that we can do very quickly with that now, and I've done this using a, a program called Lanxbox, is look at near synonyms, look at words they share, and look at words which are unique to them. So in this case, we have great and good. We can see just from looking at this chart the good is a much busier word. It has many more collocates, words that strongly associate with it, than great. And great and good only share a few collocates. So, for example, a player you might describe equally as either great or good. Uh, Britain is only great. You all know that Britain is not in the least bit good. Uh, opportunities are great, but they're not good. So we can see these patterns of usage emerge from language using corpus linguistics. We can look at things like synonyms, and I think actually almost all synonyms are near synonyms rather than true synonyms, and you can see that nicely visualized here. We've also used different uh, colors for the parts of speech. Incidentally, the whole talk today is based on a paper which is coming out in the next annual review of applied linguistics, so we don't want to scribble furiously during this presentation. Uh, just wait until the autumn and you can read a full version of the paper anyway. So, Corpus Linguistics gives us access to large databases of attended, attested language use, and that can reflect different forms of language, whether that be speech or writing in an L1, or speech or writing in an L2. But Learner Corpora focuses on this L2 aspect of corpus data. The great thing, of course, about uh, Corpus Linguistics is that before this sort of open access or open data initiatives came along, Corpus Linguists were doing that anyway. If you have a machine-readable corpus, the easiest thing in the world to do is to share it with somebody else. I can email you my corpus sometimes, and you can use it. So we're not talking about data sets which remain hidden forever, except in the case of some commercial data sets, which I'll mention later on. So corpus linguistics is almost by design uh, in line with the open access movement. Also, I think it's good in terms of scientific practice in that when we make annotations in our corpora, our analyses are embedded in the corpora, we share those annotations with others, and our annotations can be critiqued. The scale of analysis, of course, afforded by corpus linguistics is uh, of a level which is quite different to that which can be achieved using manual methods. Uh, individual scholars can analyze billions of words rapidly. If we try to do that in a more qualitative mode of analysis without computers, we deal with very much smaller quantities of data. And with much smaller quantities of data, the patterns that we can see in the data are correspondingly less reliable in terms of their generalizability. 
because corpus findings are based on the observations typically of a very large number of examples. As you saw with the example of great and good uh, that I just showed you, that was based on three million words. And it's only when we start to get up to that level of data that we start to see the patterns that we want to see emerging. Nonetheless, I've promised that this is going to be a gently critical talk. Uh, and I'd still say that there are problems which we have to consider. And this problem that I'm going to look at today relates largely to something that hasn't happened with learner corpora. And this talk, to some extent, is a meditation on why that hasn't happened. Early in the life cycle of the production of learner corpora, and I'll talk in a moment about when I think the first learner corpora came into existence, but here I give you uh, a quote from 2009 from Granger where she says, this new resource will soon be accepted as a bona fide data type in SLA research. And that claim was made much earlier in the life cycle of learner corporate than that. We have the problem that they haven't been used widely in SLA research. Now, I don't take that as the fault of SLA researchers. And as I say, this talk in some ways a meditation on why this is the case. But to give you an example of actually how little impact learner corpora have had on SLA, just look at the latest supplement of the Modern Language Journal, edited by Duff and Burns, SLA Across Disciplinary Borders, New Perspectives, Critical Questions and Research Possibilities. There we have 15 quite outstanding contributions. They're very good papers. It's well worth reading. But of those 15 contributions, Slabakova uses L1 corpus data, Hall cites L1 corpus studies as corroboration for points made, and Ellis argued, not this Ellis, Tother Ellis, argues for the use of corpora in general. Learner corpora are never specifically referenced or discussed in any of the state-of-the-art papers in this important volume. So I set about asking myself the question, why is this the case? Now, I don't believe SLA researchers are wicked or ill-informed. In fact, many of them are good friends of mine. I was actually just very interested in why this long heralded impact on SLA research from learner corpora has not happened. Okay. Now, there are some studies which use learner corpora with the aim of contributing to SLA theory. Florence Miles has reviewed a few of them, and indeed, Yukio Tono uh, in Japan many years ago when he worked with me in Lancaster did some early work looking at some of Krashen's work and seeing to what extent uh, that it was well borne out in corpus data. So some things have happened. So we're talking about a matter of degree rather than absolutes. And indeed, corpus linguistics has been mentioned in major reference works in SLA. And more recently, in a special volume of language learning I did with Patrick Rebuchat and Dietmar Meurs, uh, we talked about the potential for this. But we're talking in 2017 about the potential still when court learner corpora have been around for 20 years. So something still needs to happen. And to make something happen, I think we need to consider the past, think about the present, and look into the future. What happened in the past that brought this state of affairs about? What are we doing in the present? And how in the future can we get a better synergy going between these two fields? Well, if we consider the past, we can find lots of studies which might appear to be early non-computer corpus-like studies which were clearly important to language learning. In fact, in the era in the uh, early part of the 20th century, we find an enormous amount of effort going into paper-based analyses of language in order to generate frequency dictionaries. Uh, so Spanish was done by Buchanan, English, of course, uh, West General Service list of, of English words, Herman in 1924. Enormous amounts of money were spent by foundations like the Carnegie Foundation uh, in generating these word lists, frequency word lists, from very large collections of paper-based data, sort of paper corpora of half a million words, and people sat down and counted the words. These were huge undertakings. But of course, they didn't deal with L2 data. So while they were painstaking pieces of work, they were difficult to replicate, and they were expensive to undertake. So if somebody picks up West and says, are you sure that this is the 39th most frequent word? Without computers and computer corpora, actually replicating what West did would be very difficult. You'd have to find the original text and go and count them by hand yourself. 
So it wasn't really learner corpus research. These frequency lists were built from L1 data. So when did learner corpus research begin? Well, I'd always argue that the apparent novelty of learner corpus research is indeed just that, apparent. People, of course, had the idea of looking at L2 learner output before learner corpora came along. And we can find plenty of little studies which, in a qualitative way, did something that looks a bit like learner corpus research prior to learner corpus uh, data being produced. So Juvenen, for example, in 1989 looked at Finnish learners of Swedish, and it looks like a small-scale study that, to all intents and purposes, is a learner corpus study, but rather qualitative in nature. Cornu and Delahaye, 87, looked at Flemish learners of French. Hubner did a really interesting study of a Hmong learner of English, uh, which is longitudinal in nature. And again, they're looking at the outputs by the speakers and trying to determine something about the language learning uh, progress in the case of Hubner or state in the case of Cornu and Delahaye and Juvenen. So we can certainly find lots of studies prior to the creation of learner corpora that looked at the production of learners of a language. And Granger also notes that much work on the categorization analysis of errors made by language learners predated learner corpus research, though again, that tends to be paper-based, difficult to replicate, difficult to verify, etc. But studies like uh, the one by Fersch et al. Uh, did that. So lots of people before learner corpora came along, of course, thought of looking at what learners wrote and what learners spoke as a way of trying to understand the process of learning. So what did learner corpora do? Well, if I say enter learner corpora, the learner corpus I'm talking about is the international corpus of learner English, which is the first corpus, as such, of learner English. It was the first corpus which drew self-consciously upon the rich methodological background of corpus linguistics. So it tried to learn from what people constructing L1 corpora had done and to compose an L2 corpus which was generally useful and which could be used in a range of research contexts rather than a specific research project. So we look back at Juvenen, and he collected his data specifically to study those speakers whereas a learner corpus is a more general collection designed to enable a broad range of studies. So the difference is that it's general in nature, not specific, not a specific research question in mind, and also the scale of it, of course, is much greater than was achieved by Juvenen, and it's more easily shareable because it's electronic. So it provides this uh, machine-readable, reusable resource that's easily accessible. It covered a range of L1 background and L2 speakers in the corpus. So again, it was more general than the specific juvenile study. We have pairs of corpora being produced at Louvain with their learner corpora. You can read about them there, but I say they're pairs because in each case what you have is a learner corpus, uh, say for example, ICL, written learner data, and then some type of matching control corpus from so-called native speakers in this case, Loch Ness. Similarly, with spoken data, uh, the Louvain people produced uh, Lindsay, which is a spoken learner corpus, and matched it with this uh, comparable data, Loch Neck, uh, which is British native English speakers, where they tried to give you some type of comparator data which you could use. So that, if you like, was the initiative that came out of Louvain, which tried to generate the learner corpus research movement. Now, the reliance on corpus research brought certain advantages, I would argue. It was much easier to co extract complex frequency data. In the time that it would take me to go through Juvenen's data to try and extract from paper some word frequencies or grammatical features, for example, I could probably have written a whole research paper based on uh, something in nickel where I can quickly look up the data and manipulate it reliably and swiftly. 
Also, it enables a wide range of statistical analyses on the data because, again, one can manipulate it reliably and swiftly and subject it to automated analyses of various sorts. So automated and, and manual linguistic analyses can be input to the data, though, of course, with learner data, it's often the case that many of the automated annotation systems, part of speech tagging, for example, that we could apply to L1 data, uh, become much more difficult because the machines have been trained on L1 data and when you apply that to L2 data, of course, any non-native features of the L2 data are likely to cause the tagger to have errors. But nonetheless, we can still usually use uh, automated systems and then post-edit them. The packages and measures, of course, which developed and helped to develop L1 corpus studies were immediately reusable with L2 corpus studies. So we didn't have to produce new programs to manipulate learner corpora. We could use the existing programs that we had. Words are words are words. So word uh, frequency extraction, for example, from learner corpus data can be undertaken using tools that you'd use on L1 corpus data. So the learner corpus initiative was able to build on all of the progress that had been made looking at, say, for example, British English, and use all of the tools that we used for that to look at learner corpora with varying degrees of success. In the present, uh, there are lots of learner corpora available, and if you check the Louvain website, they have a very nice uh, catalog of various uh, corpora that are available that you can get, usually free, and download them. But also in the commercial sphere, we also have learner corpora, some of which are available, some of which are not, which you can also access. So, for example, the Longman Learner Corpus, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment, isn't available in the public domain, but is used, as we'll see, uh, in lots of their products. Uh, ETS, the Educational Testing Service, has made a learner corpus of sorts available, as have Cambridge University Press. Again, Cambridge used this data uh, to inform their products. So, learner corpora have been used extensively by learner corpus researchers, and they're also well established in academic settings in the commercial marketplace. Of course, the commercial nature of the data means sometimes that something like the Longman learner corpus isn't available in the public domain because they can see real commercial value in the data and they don't want to share it. That's their argument. It could also be that they don't want it exposed to criticism because criticism of the data then, of course, becomes criticism of the product on which the data is based, uh, which is based upon the data, uh, which is possibly another reason, as we'll see in a moment, that they don't share it publicly. However, the extent to which these resources are used beyond the learner corpus research community is less clear, uh, and use by SLA researchers is vanishingly low, as I've said which brings us back to the question of why. And for me, one of the most insightful critiques of the learner corpus research enterprise was made by the first book review that I came across of the first book written about learner corpora. Uh, Sylvian Granger wrote uh, Learner uh, Language on the Computer, and in the review of it by Lessard, he made three points. Firstly, the corpora that are used are still relatively small, which hinders the use of statistical tests. Secondly, the annotation of the data was sparse, and more was needed if the data were to be uh, exploited more effectively. There's a lot more to linguistic analysis than simply noting the morphosyntactic category of each word. And then finally, and possibly most damaging from the point of view of SLA research, Apart from a few theoretical constructs, such as overuse and underuse, which then became very dominant in learner corpus research in the uh, interlanguage hypothesis, uh, or the contrastive uh, hypothesis, with respect to native speaker usage, there is a serious lack of contact with the notions of current linguistic theory. So a separate theoretical paradigm was established based on what could be measured easily in the data, which was overuse and underuse relative to some native speaker norm, typically. Now, some of you might be sitting there and thinking, well, that was 1999. Surely things have changed since then. But I was very struck recently in reading another review of a book from 2015, the review by Brezina and Bottini, 
in which almost exactly the same criticisms were made. Cochetta et al. had written a sort of edited collection on the use of learner corpora, and in the review by Brezina and Bottini, they make a series of points about the studies which are very similar to the points made by Lessard in 1999. That tells me two things. One, the separation of the paradigms is still evident. Two, there seems to be very little uh, in the way of communication between the two paradigms, even though, of course, in terms of theoretical developments, I think SLA offers a very, very rich framework that could inform a lot of research in learner corpus studies. Okay. Some of the criticisms that we could make uh, do also relate to quantity and quality of data available. Lessard's first point. It was true in 1999. It's still true now. If we look at the ICL corpus, for example, um, lots of words which you'd say aren't particularly rare. If you asked any native speaker, you'd ask, expect them to know them and be able to use them quite fluently and tell you quite a bit about the words. Words like chill, erna, pester, sunburn, and vases occur only once in the corpus. There's very little you can say about those words. So even moderately frequent words are still very rare in the ickle corpus, a strong indication that the corpus is still far too small for what we need to do. And of course, combining factors in the analysis can swiftly lead to data sparsity issues. So it's fine for me to say, well, I have a million words, so there. But if your million words is, for example, our speakers from 10 different L1 backgrounds, well, if that's spread evenly, then that's only 100,000 words per speaker, per, uh, per L1 background. So data sparsity issues can actually kick in very quickly when we look at learner corporate because we want to use all of these factors that we know about the data because we know that they're linguistically meaningful from research in SLA. But once we start to operationalize them, the amount of data available to explore any specific hypothesis becomes quite low. Let me give you an example from the Longman Learner Corpus. Uh, the Longman Learner Corpus, as I've said, is used in their products, such as the Longman Active Study Dictionary. Uh, we're fortunate enough at Lancaster to have access to the Longman Learner Corpus, so I can give you these results, though unfortunately you can't get them for yourself, so you'll just have to trust me. <laughs> okay. But there we have nine million words. I could have strode onto the stage and said, I'm studying nine million words, quake before me and accept all that I say. But I'm not going to say that. What I'm going to tell you is about why you should be skeptical when somebody says they're going to study something this complex with just nine million words. Okay. I have 18 L1 backgrounds in that data. I have eight levels of proficiency in that data. I have three target varieties of English. British, American, Australian in that data, and I have nine different task types. Again, you could all quake, but if some of you are starting to multiply those things together, you come to some rather startling conclusions. Well, if I want to carry out a specific study, say taking one L1 background, one level of proficiency, one variety of English, and one task type, well, I find that I have 3,888 categories to choose between. If the data is smoothly spread between those categories, I have about 2,300 words per category to look at. Now, that isn't very much more data than Juvenan had in 1989 for his study. So claims of scale start to vanish there. There are still claims of utility that I could make. Oh, look, it's a good general data set. You don't need to collect it. But in terms of claims of scale, there isn't actually that much for the type of specific study that we'd want to do. So apparently large, well-balanced data sets, when explored through the metadata, the data about the data provided with them, become very unbalanced typically. The data is not smoothly distributed in that corpus. So if we look at great and good again, uh, and say to ourselves, okay, well, I just want to know about those words in a set essay task, uh, intermediate learners of English, any L1 background with British English as a target variety, I get 2,832 examples overall. I might say, well, that's quite enough. Couldn't you just study those? And I'd say, well, 
What about Thai and Malay then? I'll look at those because the data allows me to. But in fact, then I get very small samples. There are only 2,886 words of Thai and 3,840 words of Malay in that specific focus available full stop before I start to look for the words great and good. And I find very few examples of them in so little data. If I move over to look at Arabic, for example, and I want to look at set essays, well, I have 141,000 words or so of data. But then I say, wait there, I'm British, I'm only really interested in British English as the target variety. Well, then it shrinks down to 113,000 words of data. If I then say, well, I'm actually interested in intermediate level speakers, I only have just under 19,000 words of data. So combining the variables, which is precisely what we would want to do if we inform our studies with the type of research that SLA researchers have done, actually shrinks our data down to vanishingly small sums, which isn't very helpful. Sometimes we have no data at all, although if you just looked at the metadata, you might assume that you would have data. So for Czech L1 speakers, for example, they all have British English as their target. There is no American English target data in there. There is no Australian English target data in there. Similarly, I can look at Korean speakers of English in the corpus, but there they only have American English as their target. There is no British English target data, no Australian English target data. So a large corpus does not guarantee a bounty of evidence for any research question that you might reasonably put to that corpus. It wasn't that I was being unreasonable in combining those factors. I know from prior research that those are important factors that do combine together. So I'm doing something entirely reasonable, but I find myself with very little data. So design decisions that we make when constricting a corpus mean that it can be used to address some questions, but not others. We have to be honest about that with people and not simply overclaim. If we overclaim, it may be the case that people come to the conclusion that we overpromise and therefore ultimately we disappoint. We have to be clear with people that corpora can answer some questions, they can't answer others, and also a specific corpus, no matter what the metadata may say, may actually not be able to answer certain questions which an initial look at the metadata might uh, lead you con to conclude that it could. Also, sometimes just gathering more data is not the answer. There are better methodological constructs that we could use in order to explore certain questions. So if I'm interested in a rare construct, for example, and often when we're working with theories, we are interested in boundary examples which will test the theory harshly and are unlikely to occur in everyday speech, then probably the corpus is the wrong place to look and you want to do something like an elicitation experiment instead. So there are certain types of research question we have for which the corpus, which excels in telling you about the everyday, will not help you because you're not interested in the everyday. So the corpus, I think, was once described to me as the sort of knockout method in linguistics. It was the thing that you could use to do anything. And I disagreed with the person who said that at the time, and I disagree with that to this day. We need to use different methods for different purposes and make sure that the method is fit to the research question that we have. And simply gathering more data isn't necessarily the answer. So what we really need to do in constructing our corpora, if we know that the way in which we construct them determines to an extent what questions can be asked of them, is to consider simply what questions do SLA researchers ask and therefore reflect that reflect upon that when we're constructing our corpora. If we construct corpora which don't allow SLA researchers to ask the questions that they would normally ask, then it's no great surprise that we don't find SLA researchers using learner corpora. So a very simple idea, but quite a powerful one. <clears throat> there are actually very few corpora at the moment that I think permit the study of variables relevant to SLA, such as proficiency level or sociolinguistic variables, task or contextual features, 
These are basic questions which people would have in their mind or parameters that they may have that they set for their research question and not many corpora would allow them to do so. So if we go back to Ickle, there's one task. If you're not interested in that particular task, the corpus is of no use to you whatsoever. It could be 20 times the size. But if it remains as being just that one task and you're not interested in that task, well, it's of no interest to you. So we need to consider the range of tasks, for example, that people want to study. Also, sometimes, as I say, people get a bit purist about these things or even messianic and say that people must use learner corpora. I don't agree. If they have research questions that can be better addressed through other methods, they should use those other methods and they should use corpora for what corpora are good at doing. So I think that the corpora that we have at the moment actually represent a bottleneck still. It's widened in that there's a wider range of them available, but many of them still have fundamental deficits with regard to what SLA researchers would like to do with such data. And only I think if we can widen that bottleneck further by taking into account what the SLA researchers want to do, will we eventually get this rapprochement between the two fields. Let me talk about another fundamental limitation I think that exists in learner corpora at the moment. I think the most fundamental limitation is the near obsessive focus on written data. I've always been worried about the focus on written data. Most of my experience of language, even though I'm a bookish don, is actually speech. And I think that's the uh, most experience of language that we all have. But of course, a lot of learner corpora and corpora more generally are focused on the written language. Why? Not for principled reasons, not for reasons that you could argue for in intellectual terms, but simply on pragmatic grounds. We can collect that type of data easily. So if you want to build a corpus of some language, I was talking to a good friend in the audience about some work I did looking at Silheti and Bangla many years ago, and we were able to construct corpora of those languages, at least in the case of Bangla, by going onto the web and downloading lots of texts in that language and building a corpus from it. If somebody said to me, is that the best corpus that you could build to study Bangla? I'd say in pragmatic terms, yes. Uh, in practical terms, no. I'd love to do a corpus of spoken Bangla and go out and collect lots of recordings and transcribe them, etc. But I don't have the money for that. I do have the money for this and I can achieve that. And that philosophy is very empowering, gets things done, but also it does lead to fundamental limitations, and it's led to this fundamental limitation in learner corpus studies of most of the data being written simply because they can be easily acquired by university researchers, as Diaz Negrillo and Thompson say. Now, while some conversational learner corpora have been produced, they are also limited in terms of uh, being short recordings, for example, or the task type being limited. Also, a lot of so-called learner corp are actually designed with the intention of exploring phonetics and phonology, and usually what you're getting is people reading out words or groups of words rather than actual conversational usage of the language, and it's actual conversational usage of the language that I'm interested in. Don't know about you, but in my 55 years of existence, nobody's ever really said to me, please read out this list of words and use that as a pretext for communication. Uh, it's something that researchers might like to do, but it's not natural language in use situated in social context. And that's what I've always been interested in as a linguist. And that's what we should be studying. Okay. Another fundamental limitation, I think, for corpus linguistics uh, when it comes to looking at the needs of SLA researchers comes to some of the basic questions asked by SLA researchers. Here are three that I've pulled from uh, Savid, Troik, and Barto. Uh, no particular reason that we should look at them, but I've managed to put all that off the bookshelf and take the three questions out of it. They seem reasonable questions to me for anybody to want to ask about language learning. What exactly does the L2 learner come to know? How does the learner acquire this knowledge? And why are some learners more successful than others? Perfectly reasonable questions. If somebody turned around to me and said, right now, Mr. Corpus, go and study these questions with your chosen method, I'd say, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. I don't think I can say ever so much about two. 
I just don't think it's a question that can reasonably be addressed with corpora as I know them. If I look at a learner corpus, even the best and the biggest in the world, and ask myself, how does the learner acquire this knowledge based on the learner corpus, I'd have to say, I can't tell you anything about that based on their production. That might be part of the answer that I would eventually come up with, but I'd need to reconceive what the learner corpus might be in order to start to answer that question. I might want to do a longitudinal study, have the learner actually carry around a tape recorder with them for 24 hours a day every now and again so I get an idea of what the inputs that they get are. I might also want to try and coordinate my corpus data with other types of instrumental data. Maybe I'll do EEG experiments with them sometimes and actually try and correlate that with some of the corpus data I've got, use other methods. Oh, answering two would be enormously difficult using corpora and corpora alone definitely couldn't answer two. I think the corpora probably can say a lot about the first question and probably corpora might say a lot about the third. But I think the second question Oh, it's fiendishly difficult, I'd say, and you'd need many methods, of which the corpus might be one, in order to start to address that. What an interesting question. So here we have, I think, another fundamental problem for the connection between corpus research and SLA research. Corpus researchers, I think, have conceived of the interests of SLA perhaps sometimes being much narrower than they actually are. And some of the questions asked by SLA researchers are very interesting questions on which corpus linguistics will remain probably largely silent and will probably remain a sideshow in terms of the uh, main work that we'd have to do to address that question. So a key fault line, I think, between uh, SLA research and learner corpus research is that SLA research has largely been theory-driven and to date has tended to test theory through psycholinguistic and other quasi-experimental methods. Now, this Ellis, I think, has said in the past that there, of course, are a range of uh, ways in which that's been done, and they've been permissive of that. So it has actually looked at languages produced by learners of the language, as well as metalinguistic judgment and self-report. Nowadays, we're finding more and more instrumental data being brought to bear on the questions of SLA. So SLA has always had, I think, a quite broad outlook in terms of the methods and data that might be used in order to pursue its research questions. So SLA has always used a broad range of methods, uh, and that's included this uh, naturally occurring language. But by contrast, learner corpus researchers have been more exploratory and pre-theoretical in their approach to learner language, and have had very basic theoretical constructs. And here we go back to Lessard again, saying that learner corpus research is based on basic theoretical constructs as overuse and underuse, and also an obsession with one method, the corpus method. So I think SLA has been broader in its methodological outlook and more sophisticated in its theoretical outlook than learner corpus research, which has narrowed its interests to one method and to a very few basic theoretical constructs such as overuse and underuse. I'm accelerating into the future now, as I've been warned, I have 10 minutes left. Okay, so what can we do in future to maximize the degree to which learner corpus research can articulate with SLA research? Well, I think actually corpus research can further permeate SLA research. It won't necessarily do everything, but it could do more than it's doing. And also, I think that it could bring significant uh, innovation if we get the right corpora. So I'm now going to talk about two things as I move towards my conclusion. How do we address the spoken corpus deficit? I think that would be part of the solution to this problem. And secondly, how might that permit us to look at neglected areas of research, or what I think are neglected areas of research? After this talk, uh, Shin Ishikawa is giving a talk on this particular corpus, I think, uh, ICNAIL, uh, the International Corpus Network of Asian Learners of English, and he's been doing a lot of good work in Asia actually trying to address this issue with reference to speakers of a range of Asian languages learning English. So we're starting to see a wider range of spoken corpora becoming available. Another spoken corpus which is becoming available, which we're uh, publishing in the autumn, 
at Lancaster is a corpus of uh, 4.1 million words of orthographically transcribed speech from 2,000 learners of British English. If any of you are interested in that, follow me on Twitter because we'll doubtless, doubtless announce it there because everything nowadays really exists on Twitter rather than in the real world. So if you're interested in this corpus and want to get hold of it in the autumn, uh, just have a look on Twitter. But there we have expressly thought about the types of questions that SLA researchers might want to ask. And we've got different levels of language proficiency in the data, uh, different L1 backgrounds, uh, some respondents with multiple L1s and where that is the case is encoding the corpus. We balance it for gender. We have a, a wide range of speakers in terms of their age. And the corpus balances reasonably well when you can combine those factors together. So we've tried to take these needs into account in the construction of this corpus. However, what we'd really like to do is now to use this corpus to look at one of the great neglected areas, I think, in learner corpus research, which is pragmatics, and especially interactional pragmatics. If you look at the uh, bibliography of learner corpus research, which is held at Louvain, there's something like 1,100 publications there. A lot of them are highly repetitive, focused on what can be found when you look for specific word forms. And very little of the work is actually on pragmatics. I think only 16 of those papers, if I count right, uh, focus on pragmatics. 14 of those look at discourse markers, again, because it's a sort of lexical realization of pragmatics. And a couple look at speech acts. But pragmatics is so much more than that. That's why I think that second language researchers have noted that there's a dearth of studies on pragmatic development using corpus techniques. The data isn't there. And what data is there hasn't been looked at in this way. And they also talk about the need, of course, for these controlling variables so that we can look at data like that and understand pragmatics in this intercultural context in this way. But corpora like Icknail and the Trinity Lancaster corpus can address this. And this is what we really want to do in the future. For now, I'm going to focus very quickly, before I conclude, on laughter. Laughter, of course, is something which is very important pragmatically. It varies as well across cultures, so you have the capacity for intercultural pragmatic failure there. It's quite interesting, but actually there's quite a limited literature on laughter. But we've made sure that it's well transcribed in the Trinity corpus, because laughter is an important pragmatic resource. It's interactive. It varies by L1 and cultural background use. It varies by levels of proficiency, we might hypothesize. It varies by task, we might hypothesize. Think about varying by task. Think about different contexts in which you might laugh in your everyday life and think how inappropriate it would be in certain contexts. Somebody comes in and tells you that your mother has died. You laugh. That's inappropriate. So we clearly do use it meaningfully. Laughter's complex. But without suitable corpus data, the large-scale investigation of it is difficult. But we can certainly see variations in the corpus when we look at it. Here, I'm looking at the uh, candidate's L1 background, and I'm looking in the conversation part of our corpus. And it seems that Spanish speakers from Mexico use more laughs than Spanish speakers from Spain. This is a nice indication, I think, that actually it's culture rather than language, which is determining the use of laughter in this context. It would be an odd hypothesis if I claimed that Spanish as a language required you to laugh more than English does. It's the culture, of course, which is determining this. So this calls to, uh, points to cultural or pragmatic differences. Across the bottom there, you can see I'm comparing Chinese, Italian, uh, uh, Peninsular Spanish, South American Spanish, Portuguese, and Hindi. If, however, I look at a different task, a discussion, where they're talking about a specific topic rather than having an open-ended conversation, uh, the difference from conversation is really shown because there is no statistical di significant difference between Spanish speakers in Spain and Mexico. So in discussion about something, they seem to act more similarly with regard to this device, laughter, than they do when in general conversation. So this isn't something I would have expected, 
but it's something I can observe in the data and which therefore I would have to develop a model which accounted for. Interestingly also, there seems to be an interaction between proficiency and the use of laughter. The higher the level of proficiency, uh, the higher level of proficiency there clearly differs in terms of laughter from the lower level proficiency. And again, this is an observation which would require an explanation. So just looking at something as simple as laughter, I can see differences, which leads me to my conclusion. Okay. I personally think that Scollin's observation about first language acquisition, that it was a sort of nexus within which a whole range of factors interacted in different ways, but interacted in different ways with respect to different questions in variable geometry, is almost certainly true of second language acquisition also. If I'm exploring second language acquisition, depending upon the research question that I have, I might use different methods in different combinations in order to get insights into it. So that's how I'd like to approach the study of second language acquisition. I'd very much like to set aside all sorts of questions of direction and dominance. Because of this variable configuration, I think there are questions that learner corpus researchers can ask of their data that are of no interest necessarily to second language acquisition researchers, but are still entirely legitimate questions, and vice versa. People can do different things with their data, and that's fine, but where they should use different methods in order to focus upon a question that needs different methods used, they should do that. So, Apart when you can be apart, together when you need to be together, depending upon the research question that you have. So I'd argue for variable geometry and research questions. Okay, thank you very much. Have one each. Thank you very much for a very, very informative and insightful presentation. Uh, we have only one or two minutes left. I'm sure many of us have uh, many questions, but uh, only one <laughs> question will be available. I'm sorry. Please raise your hand. Your question. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, microphone. Yeah, thank you for addressing what I think is a fundamental issue in your field and my field, uh, the nexus mm. or the lack of it. Yeah. Um, one of the problems with second language acquisition is it has now become a very incoherent field of study. Um, it started off as a very sort of psycholinguistic area of study and increasingly there's been a social turn and there's been a switch from looking at acquisition to looking at use. Now, I think that probably when you come to look at use, then corpus linguistics still has a lot to actually offer. Yeah. I am not convinced that it has much to offer the psycholinguistic approaches to acquisition, largely because built into this word acquisition is the notion of change and by and large, the, I, I don't think that there are many corpora that can actually document change, except very crudely in terms of preemptive definitions of proficiency, right? Yeah. So I, I, I think that what you're going to find is that corpus linguistics will be increasingly used in that branch of SLA that is, uh, which, which corresponds to the social turn and focuses on use and doesn't answer the kind of fundamental psycholinguistic research questions uh, that dominated the field for a long time and have still are still there. Yeah. I'd agree with that entirely and I think actually your point underlines the point I made about corpus linguistics being silent on some questions that are entirely reasonable questions to ask yeah. such as those ones but where the method just doesn't apply very well you could, as I say, start to conceive of a hugely expensive, long-term, longitudinal study of learners in order to ask, answer questions about how acquisition occurs. But it would be enormously expensive and enormously complex to do 
And at the end of it, somebody might say, couldn't if we have done that much cheaper using elicitation and lab-based methods? And actually, my answer would probably be yes, which would stop me applying for the project in the first place. So I think you're entirely right. And what we really need to do is have these moments of honesty where we say, for those questions, the corpus doesn't really answer the question. Uh, and in order to try and force it to do so would probably be prohibitively expensive and a waste of time. But for these questions, well, it definitely does have something to say, and we need to form the questions, uh, we need to form the data in order to allow us to respond to those questions, because at the moment it's not quite well formed enough. So I think I'm in furious agreement with you. I think we need to finish it here. Let's give you a big Thank round you. of applause.